Hi, everyone. So I'm going to keep this really brief uh, so we have plenty of time for Simon. And uh, just quick introduction. We've uh, been hoping to get Simon here to give this talk for a while now. You may know his work uh, either at Yahoo or as one of the co-founders of Django, the uh, web framework for developing content. And uh, Simon is, in my eyes, one of this new generation of uh, identity crusaders, people trying to break down the identity silos. Uh, and he's here to give a talk on maybe the most interesting one of those, OpenID. Simon Wilson. Okay. Um, does that work? Sweet. Oh, hold on. I'm going, f yeah. Right. Uh, good afternoon. So I've been thinking about and experimenting with OpenID for well over a year now. And I've basically convinced myself that it represents a major step forward in the way we do authentication on the web. Out of all of the options, it seems like the one that's most obviously correct and is most obviously actually going to go somewhere. Um, and while OpenID itself is pretty straightforward, the implications of adopting it really aren't. And this is, uh, there are a huge number of questions and issues that always come up when people are thinking about this stuff. So the format of this talk is essentially a series of question and answers. It's basically, it's an FAQ. And like so many FAQs, I made up all of the questions myself. But I will be taking extra questions at the end of the session. So let's see if this clicker works. OK, so uh, firstly, a question for you. Who here has used OpenID? That's, that's a decent number. And who here actually uses it regularly? Like on a, that, yeah, hardly anyone at all. We're, we're going to try and make that better. Like the, the, a lot of what I'm doing at the moment is trying to get people to adopt it so those of us who use it have more stuff that we can do with it. So we'll start with the basics. What is OpenID? And I, I, I describe OpenID as a decentralized mechanism for single sign-on. So what problems does it solve? Well, there's, there's a bunch of them. The first and the really obvious one is the too many passwords problem. We all have far too many accounts and far too many services with, which, with the, which are protected by usernames and passwords. And of course, you should never use the same password on lots of different sites, because if one of them gets compromised, you lose all of them. But who can manage an individual password for everything they sign up for? And this is a problem which as, uh, OK, so some of us can, but that, you're a statistical anomaly, let's face it. So, um, so we've all got too many passwords. And as early adopters and technologists, this is a big problem for us. But it's going to be a problem. It's a problem for regular users soon. And if it isn't, it, regular users right now. And it'll be an even bigger problem for them as, as the stuff we do becomes even more pervasive. So that's problem number one. Second problem, someone also already grabbed my username. You go to a site, it asks you to pick a username, and you try username after username, and they've all already been registered. And there's another problem which really affects those of us who have chosen to expose our lives online. And that's that my online profile is scattered across dozens of sites. I've got a Flickr account, a, Twist, uh, a Twitter account, YouTube accounts. I've got accounts everywhere. And personally, I'd quite like to be able to tie those together into a more, more of an integrated whole. So that's what OpenID is. What is an OpenID? And an OpenID is quite simply a URL. Here are some of mine. I'm, si I'm swillison.livejournal.com. I'm simonw.myopenid.com. simonwillison.net, which is a domain that I actually own. And thanks to AOL, I've got openid.aol.com slash simonwillison, where Simon Willison is my AOL screen name. And in fact, 63 million people who have AOL accounts actually have OpenIDs already, and they probably just don't know about them. So that's what an open ID is. But what can you do with one? And really, open ID, you can only do one thing. It's very simple. You can claim that you own it. I can, I can make an assertion to someone that I own simonwillison.net or I own swillison.livejournal.com. And then I can prove that claim. And, that, and for that reason, why, like, why is that useful? It's because you can use it for authentication. The fact that you are the only person who can assert ownership over a particular URL means you can use that fact to authenticate with services. So it might work like this. You go to a site. And the site goes, who the heck are you? And you go, well, I'm simonwillison.net. Prove it. Magic happens. This is, I, I'm going to be jumping, I'm going to be skipping most of the technical details because you're, you're smart, smart people, you can read, read the spec. OK, you're in. So I've logged into the site. So if it's doing single sign-on, it, it's a bit like Microsoft Passport. Well, it is. But firstly, you don't need to ask Microsoft permission to implement this on your site. And secondly, Microsoft don't get to own your credentials and the credentials of everyone else in the world, which even if it's not Microsoft, that's, that's still a little bit creepy. When I, I don't know if, if that's what we want to happen. 
So who does get to own your credentials? Who gets to, to look after your identity for you? And with OpenID, you, the user, decide who that is. So you pick your own provider. You find a company or organization that you trust to run your OpenID for you, just like you do with email. And um, so does this mean I'm, I'm still giving somebody the keys to my kingdom? It does, but it can be someone you trust. And again, just like email, if you have the ability to run software on your own server, you can, you can be your own OpenID provider. You can answer, answer to no one. So how do you use this thing? And this is where the embedded videos will hopefully work. Um, I'll, I'll show you. This is an example of signing into a site called Zuma.com, which is an online photo sharing site. You go there, and Zuma says, log in with your open ID. So it gives you a box and asks you for your open ID. So I'll enter my open ID. I'll enter a live journal one, swillison.livejournal.com. I click the button there, and I'm redirected back to my provider. So Zuma says, OK, that's the open ID. Who's the provider for this? It's Live Journal. So they, they redirect me over to Live Journal's site. Live Journal says, you need to be logged in to grant another site permission to know your identity. So I'm going to log into Live Journal using my regular Live Journal username and password. And once I've logged in, Live Journal asks me a question. It says, OK, now you're logged in. Um, another site on the web wants to validate your Live Journal identity. Essentially, Zuma wants to know who you are. Is this OK? And there are three options. I can say yes just this time. I can say yes always, or I can say no. I'm going to say yes always. And I'm redirected back to Zuma, and I'm signed in with that Live Journal account. So I've signed into Zuma without having to give Zuma a password. And that's like, it's kind of nice, but I still had to enter a username and password. It didn't actually save me any time. The nice thing about this is if I log out of Zuma, Zuma because I'm now permanently logged into Live Journal, I've got Live Journal's cookie on my machine, uh, if I, should I try and log into Zuma again? It'll, it'll um, oh, so my users don't have to sign up for an account. Hang on. Uh, oh, here we go. So now I'm signing, out of, I'm signing out of Zuma, and I go to sign in again. I really hope I've got that video in there. There we go. But this time, I'm already logged into Live Journal, and I told Live Journal that I always trust Zuma. So when I click the button, instead of being, I get redirected to Live Journal. You can see that happening if you look at the status bar. And then I get redirected straight back to Zuma and logged in. So that's single sign-on, where, wherein you only enter your username. You don't even have to, you don't enter a password at all. And the nice thing about OpenID is, um, in the same way that e-commerce sites have standard names for your address field and your postcode and so on, OpenID does the same thing. So your browser can even auto-complete that field for you. So does this mean that my users don't have to sign up for an account? Does this mean I'm basically saying, to hell with accounts, I'm not going to have any accounts, and, and hence I don't really have a database of the people using my service? Well, no, not necessarily. An open ID actually tells you very little about a user. You don't know their name. You don't know their email address. You don't know if they're a person or some evil robot or, or a dog or anything. And so where do you get that information from? Well, Obviously, you, you ask them, just like you would with a regular person who comes up and signs out for an account on your service. And OpenID can even help them answer your questions. Um, this is another demo. This is a feature of OpenID called Simple Registration. And the myopenid.com provider lets you set up personas. So it lets you set up essentially collections of um, attributes about yourself. Here I've saved a persona with a nickname, a full name, and an email address. And now if I go to sign up for a site for the first time, Magnolia here is an online bookmark site. It gives me the option to sign up normally, or it lets me sign up with an open ID. So I'll put in my simonwillison.myopenid.com address. I'm sent back here. And in addition to asking me if I want to sign into Magnolia, it also says, Magnolia also wanted to um, collect your nickname and your email address and your full name. And I can say, yes, that's fine. Or if I don't want Magnolia to get those details, I can edit them. But again, I, I say that's OK. I click um, Allow Forever. I'm redirected back to Magnolia, but it pre-fills in some of the fields in the registration form. So really, it's just a smart way of, um, a simple way of, of pre-filling some fields, but it does help out with that initial account creation process. And again, create my account, go straight through, and now I've got a brand new account on Magnolia, but I didn't really have to, all I really had to do was enter my open ID and click a couple of buttons. How do I tell if someone's an evil spam bot? Well, again, it's just like you would with a regular account. You get them to, you challenge them with some kind of capture. So how does OpenID actually work? What's really going on behind the scenes? Well, an OpenID is a URL, and at a URL you have a web page. In this case, um, simonwilson.myopenid.com is this rather unattractive page. They've actually redesigned since I took these screenshots. I'm telling you, this is an, uh, an identity page. But if you view source on this page, you get this. You get a little um, link element saying link rel equals OpenID server and href equals myopenid.com slash server. And that link element is what turns a URL into an OpenID. 
So you go to a site, you say, I'm simonwilson.myopenid.com. A site fetches the HTML from that page, passes it, and looks for that link element, which tells them where your identity provider is. And at that point, they know who they're, going to, who they're going to send you to. They then establish a shared secret with their identity provider. They use Diffie-Hellman key exchange for that. And that's because the site you're logging into and your provider may never have heard of each other, but they do need to transmit a little bit of information securely so that they know that you're not sat in the middle like lying about, so, so that they can assert the claim that's being sent between the sites. Um, the site redirects me to the identity provider. If I'm logged in now, I got re get redirected back. So that, that link tag is all, that, is all that you need to turn a page into an open idea and let the site you're signing into know where it, can, where it should send you to check your identity. How does your, open, how does your identity provider know how you are? Well, so far I've shown you stuff with usernames and password, but OpenID deliberately doesn't specify how authentication with the provider should work. So while usernames and passwords are common, providers can use other methods if they want to. And providers are already experimenting with things like client SSL certificates that you install in your browser, out-of-band authentication via an SMS text message or an email or a jab Jabber message. People have worked with IP-based login restrictions. There's one guy that actually set up a dynamic DNS thing so that his open ID provider would recognize if he was on his home network and let him straight in, but if he was somewhere else, it would ask him to authenticate. And people are working with secure ID key fobs, which I'm sure everyone here has one of those little things with the number that changes and, and is, part of, is part of the two-factor authentication to get into an account. You could even have something that does no authentication at all. It just says yes to any, to any question about who owns an open ID. Like just say yes. Why is that useful? Well, it's the open ID equivalent of a site you may have seen called bugmenot.com. And bugmenot.com um, is a site you can go to and you can say, I need a username and password for the New York, for New York Times .com, and it'll give you one. And the, the, the service exists because there are lots of sites out there that force you to register to access their content. But as a user, you don't care about that account. You, you get no value for it. You don't care if lots of other people use it. So people are already, start, already share username and password accounts. And OpenID, someone's built a service which does essentially the same thing. There's a site, jkg.in slash OpenID, which will say yes to any request that comes in. And again, users give, give away their passwords today. This is just the open ID equivalent of doing that. What do you do if you decide that you hate your provider? You've been using this open ID provider for a while, and then they do something really creepy, and you decide that you don't want to trust them anymore. Well, you can use your own domain name or a site that you own, and you can delegate to a provider that you trust. And I do exactly that on my, my own site. This is simonwilson.net. It's my blog. And if you view source on simonwilson.net, you can see it's got these magic lines, openid.server, to say that it's an open ID but also openid.delegate. And if I try and log into something with simonwilson.net, that site pulls back those tags and it says, OK, well, his openid provider is livejournal.com, and, op and the open ID I need to check is actually swilson.livejournal.com. So instead of checking that I'm simonwilson.net, it'll go and check if I'm swilson.livejournal.com. And if I am, it'll let me sign in as simonwilson.net. Nice thing here is that if I decide I don't want to use livejournal.com anymore, I can switch to another provider, change those two lines of HTML on my page, and I can keep on using my open ID while, sw while switching out the provider that I'm trusting with my identity. And support for delegation is a compulsory part of the open ID spec, which really helps minimize lock-in and, and keep this thing truly decentralized. So everyone will end up with one open ID that they use for everything. That's not actually the plan, and this is probably not going to happen. I mean, I, for one, have half a dozen open IDs already. I've shown you some of them so far. And this really ties into a bigger, bigger thing where people like to maintain multiple online personas. They've been doing that since people started using the internet on Usenet or whatever. You might have the persona you use for your professional things, which is tied to your real name and you use for going to conferences and whatever. You may have a social persona you use with your friends, which might be your my, um, sort of spin out from your MySpace page. You may have a secret persona that you use for doing things online that you don't necessarily want other people to know about. And OpenID actually makes it easier to manage these multiple personas. You create a separate OpenID for each one, because three accounts is still better than three dozen different accounts. And it, it makes it easier for you to keep track of which identity you're, pre you're presenting to which particular site or service. Now, if an OpenID is just a URL, is there anything else interesting that you can do with it aside from signing into things? And well, yes, there is. Different OpenIDs can express different things. And I think this is one of the things that makes OpenID so interesting. So I've shown you a bunch already, but my AOL open ID embeds my AOL instant messenger screen name. So if I sign into a service with that, the service now knows how it can send me instant messages. 
Um, Sun, Sun Microsystems, recently in a, um, launched an OpenID provider that's only available to Sun employees. So if you see an OpenID from openid.sun.com, you can be sure that the owner of that OpenID is one of Sun's 33,000 employees with access to that service. Um, there are things you could potentially do. Last.fm, the music sharing service, knows, a lot, um, knows and represents a bunch of stuff about your taste in music. So if they supported OpenID, you could say, if someone signs in with OpenID from Last.fm, I now know how to look up their taste in music and maybe provides personalized services around that. My live journal OpenID, first, first up, it tells you where to find my blog. And by extension, it shows you where to find an RSS feed about me. But it also links through to a friend of a friend file that LiveJournal have, um, listing, listing my friends on LiveJournal. And there's a service called doxory.com, which is already, is already using this for contact import. You sign into doxory.com with a LiveJournal open ID, and it'll look up your friends on LiveJournal, check if they're in the doxory.com system, and if they are, give you the option to friend them there as well. And personally, I think friend import is a killer app for open ID and technologies like it. Why would you implement OpenID over all the other identity standards? Well, quite frankly, OpenID is dirt simple. The specification is about two pages long. I think conceptually it makes a great deal of sense. Um, and also it follows the Unix philosophy of, of development, where OpenID, rather than taking on this enormous problem of identity, which can start massive debates that go on for, for years and never really get anything done, it picks one tiny little problem and solves that. With the idea being that you build this thing that solves one problem, then you build all of the other interesting stuff on that, on that one basis. Um, if, you're into, if, if you know your internet theory, open ID is what people call a dumb network. So the internet's described as a dumb network because the internet knows nothing of the packets that it's transmitting from point A to point B. It knows that it ha its job is to get data from one place to another, but it doesn't know what the data is. It doesn't know what it represents. And the internet is interesting because of all of the applications people build on the edges of that network that do know about data formats. And I think with open ID, the same thing's going to happen, where open ID is a very dumb protocol for saying this person, this, this entity uh, can assert ownership of this URL. But people will then start to build stuff on top of it that do interesting things around the edges without the OpenID specification needing to be changed at all. And also, many of the competing identity standards are now on board the and now on board with OpenID. About a year and a half ago, a bunch of people who were working on competing standards for decentralized and URL-based identity got, um, got, got behind OpenID and sort of contributed their ideas to that. So at least from the point of view of the identity community, it's got, it's got some pretty major backing that it really, really looks like it's going somewhere. But a fundamental problem that people have with single sign-on is, doesn't this mean that I'm putting all of my eggs in one basket? And surely that's a really bad idea. I mean, what someone steals my open ID, they can steal everything. And this is absolutely true. And the bad news is that the chances are you already do this. And the chances are that pre people on the internet are already doing this because of the I forgot my password feature that you get on pretty much any website. Um, and I, I forgot my password means your email account is already an SSO mechanism. If somebody stole my Gmail account, they could do a search for password reminders. And they'd find accounts from hundreds and hundreds of sites that I've coupled with that Gmail account. So, OpenID really just makes it a little bit obvious that this is what people are doing. What about phishing? And I know this is the principal concern about OpenID for most people. And again, phishing is a major problem. It's a big problem with OpenID because, of, well, I'll, I'll show you an example. Um, let's say someone builds a site called ICANN has lolcats, and it's a service where people can go and create lolcats and, and have fantastic fun bothering their friends with them. And so here's that site. It goes, sign in with your OpenID. Um, uh, like, yay, I don't even have to create an account here. So I enter my OpenID, click the button. It sends me to my identity provider. But actually, it's, it's an evil lolcat site. And it's, um, it, it serves up a fake edition of my identity provider. It, it pulls down the HTML. It rewrites the forms. So it's a different URL, but who looks at URLs? And so instead of lolcats, I get identity theft. And so the, the phishing stuff works, because you go to an untrusted site, and it redirects you to supposedly your trusted provider. And this should sound familiar, because PayPal do this, Yahoo browser-based authentication do this, Google Auth do this, and Google Checkout do this as well. So yeah, this is a problem. Phishing is a major problem. It's a problem that you guys already have, and you really need to, to look into solving. OpenID does not change this in the slightest. Um, there, are, there are a bunch of solutions. I mean, the OpenID community is thinking very hard about this, and a bunch of solutions have come up. One solution that um, people have is, since the problem is you redirect to a page where you authenticate, just don't let the user log in on, that land, on the identity provider landing page. So I run an OpenID provider called idproxy.net. And if you attempt to sign in using OpenID to there, 
and you're not logged in, you'll get this screen instead. It says you need to sign in, you need to log into idproxy.net to complete this process. You should use a bookmark or type in the address to do this. This page does not contain any links to protect you from phishing. Now, this is not the solution to phishing because a, fish, a, a phishing site could serve up this page and say, new, improved usability, click here to enter your password, that kind of thing. And, and most people wouldn't know the difference. But from my point of view, I run this provider. I do know the difference. And I, I find this makes me a little bit more comfortable about using it because I, I don't, I, if I forget to check the URL bar, I'm, I'm not going to get phished. Um, there are better solutions. So one solution that's... Um, quite important these days is card space. Card space is a new thing built into Windows Vista, which I think is also available for Windows XP as part of some enormous service pack style .NET download. But card space is specifically designed to combat phishing. And it's a way of signing into a site where instead of entering a username and password, you click to you click on the use card space thing. And card space then takes over your entire screen. It's like full page. The idea being that websites, like phishing sites, can't do that. Um, I wonder if they could do that with Flash. I'm not sure. And so, but card space is Microsoft's, Microsoft's big bet again, big gamble on, on solving the phishing problem. Um, and this leads us through to, the, to another idea, which is native browser support for things like OpenID. Now, VeriSign are doing a lot of work with OpenID, and they put out this Firefox extension called Seatbelt. And Seatbelt um, basically sits in your browser watching what you're doing, and it looks out for evidence that you're starting an OpenID transaction. And if you are, it makes damn sure that you're doing that against your identity provider and not some fake. And it gives you other little things like um, the, the Seatbelt toolbar will tell you if you're signed into your identity provider. It'll encourage you to sign into your provider first thing when you launch your browser. And that's, that's really good news. And Firefox have, and Mozilla have announced that Firefox 3 is going to have OpenID support. At least it's one bullet point on a massive list on their wiki. So hopefully in Firefox 3, they'll, they'll integrate something like Seatbelt, which will help, help deal with this problem. But on a more, on a, on a more sort of, um, on, a, on a less technical basis, I think one thing we're going to see is competition between providers as a driver for solutions to phishing and security. If you're looking for an OpenID provider, there are loads of them out there, and there, there, there are more, there are more every, every few months. And if those providers can convince you that they have better security, better phishing protection than, than the other providers, then that's one way that they can distinguish themselves and convince people to sign up for them. And again, we're already seeing this happen. MyOpenID.com, that I showed you earlier, recently launched client-side browser SSL certificates as a, as a way of, of, of securing, your, securing your OpenID. Um, there's, another, there's another concept I heard quite recently, which I think is very interesting, and that's using a permanent cookie set using an out-of-band token. So one great way of solving phishing is you do out-of-band authentication. When someone tries to sign in, you SMS text message them a authentication code, which they have to enter, so that then when they're trying to sign into a phishing site, they don't get the message and they can't continue. And what you can do is use that, use that out-of-band token to set a permanent cookie in their browser, saying, OK, this browser has done that stage of authentication. And then you won't be bothering them with out-of-band messages in the future. But should they start using a different browser, you can send them a one-time message to, to, um, to set that browser up as, as, as um, authenticated. And they still have to log in normally, but a phishing site which never got hold of that cookie wouldn't be able to sign into your system. So I think that's something people really need to start looking at. Uh, what are best practices for OpenID consumers, for sites that people log into with OpenID? Well, the first one is that you need to you need to keep, keep onto that I forgot my password thing. But you need to offer it as I can't sign in using my open ID. So there's something wrong. And that's so that when someone's provider goes down, they can still log into your site. If they forget who their open ID provider is, which could potentially happen, they can still log in as well. Um, you also, um, one thing that's very important I forgot to make a slide for is that providers shouldn't be replacing usernames and passwords with OpenID because doing so means 95% of your audience will, won't have the slightest idea how to use your service. OpenID doesn't replace usernames and passwords. It provides an, alt an alternative to them. So the site I showed you earlier, Magnolia, the sign-in page says, log in with your username and password, and then underneath it says, if you've got an OpenID, you can log in with that instead. And I think that's definitely the way people need to adopt this stuff. Um, I said you should allow people to associate open IDs. I actually think you should allow people to associate multiple open IDs with a single account on a site. And there are a bunch of reasons to do that. Firstly, um, again, people can still sign in if one of their providers is down. If LiveJournal's down, I'll sign in with my um, myopenid.com account, and I can still get to my account. It also means people can unassociate an open ID without locking themselves out, which is quite useful. 
But most importantly, it means you can take advantage of these site-specific services around each of their open IDs. If you've got a single account on your site, and people have signed in use, and if people have signed into that account using an AOL account, so you know their, their AOL um, screen name, and they've signed in with the last FM account, so you know their taste in music, you can start gathering more information and more services about that single user in your system. Are there any other neat tricks you can do this stuff? Well, there's a ton of these. And this is, OpenID is at its core single sign-on, but because it provides a URL, because it provides a globally unique identifier for your users, you can build a stack of interesting things on top of it. Um, the first one of these, and I think this is the killer app, is the portable contact list that I talked about earlier with respect to friend of a friend. And um, there's also work going around, uh, on around microformats of this stuff. So an open ID takes you to a page with a microformat XFN list. XFN is a way of um, listing your friends. And you, a site can then pass that, pull out those friends, and import them into your new system. So you don't have to go through that rigmarole of signing up for a new social software site and instantly adding hundreds of people that you know, ju know just to try out the service. Um, here's a great problem which you guys have, and that's that Facebook and lots of other sites currently ask for your, the user's Google username and password just so they can sign into their Gmail account and, and look at their contact list. And I don't need to tell you why that's a horrible idea. The, the sooner the internet can come up with a standard that means people aren't doing that, the better. And the damage, in, in a way, the damage is already being done in teaching users that it's OK to give your username and password to any site that asks for it. Um, but back to cool things you can do with, with OpenID. Another one which I really like is this idea of lightweight accounts, services where you'd never normally sign up for an account because it's like commenting on someone's blog or whatever, but you are willing to, to sign in with an OpenID. And so I think that, and in that, in that respect, OpenID ends up acting as a, basically a way of making persistent cookies. So whereas there are preferences that you'd save in a cookie normally, but the cookie would eventually expire or the user would switch to another machine, if you instead associate those preferences with their open ID, then you've got the same kind of data you'd store in a cookie, but it can be persisted across any time they log in with the same open ID. Another thing you can do is pre-approved accounts. Let's say I set up a, a collaborative weblog for members of my band. Um, and then rather than sending them all an email saying, I've set up a new WordPress install, you guys should log in and set a password and all of that, you just pre-approve you pre -approve their open IDs. You stick in the list of the four open IDs of the band members, and then, you can say, and then you can say to them, hey, I've set up a blog and you guys can all log in already. In a way, it's like having a um, public key for SSH authentication, which you distribute to anyone so they can put it on their server and you can log in without you, without, without you having to do anything else extra. Another thing for OpenID, social whitelists. So I do this on my own weblog. I've got a comment spam filtering system, which is, has a bunch of weird rules in it. But one of the rules is that if you, if you post the comment and you're signed in with an OpenID that I've, I've already approved, you skip the entire comment spam system. And what's nice there is I can publish that list of people. I can publish the list of the 30 or so OpenIDs that I trust to post comments on my site. And then anyone else can say, well, I'm going to let anyone post on my site who Simon lets post on his site. So we can build these whitelists and start distributing them and sharing them across lots of people. And hopefully that will help tide, some, tide at least some of the, the masses of comment spam that everyone's getting. Uh, open idea microformats I mentioned earlier, the idea of having XFN there. But really, with mic microformats mean that you have data on a page that, that can be extracted out. And open ID is a great way of... Um, essentially doing lookups for microformats. So you say, here's my open ID. You can prove ownership over it. The site can then go to that open ID and suck any and every microformat out of that page. So it fits in with microformats really nicely. And a much bigger idea is this concept of decentralized social networks. And um, there's a nice quote from a guy called Gary McGraw who said, people keep asking me to join the LinkedIn network, but I'm already part of a network. It's called the internet. And what I want to see happen is, open, is services based around open ID um, but coming up with ways of doing the same sort of convenience that you get from centralized social networking services like Facebook and MySpace and so on, but in a de decentralized manner. So we don't end up all relying on, on one provider for all of our online social networky interactions. Um, but back to questions about OpenID, there's a question that you hear a lot, and actually this is probably one of the scariest things for people who are thinking about implementing OpenID as a, as a consumer, is doesn't having OpenID mean I'm outsourcing the security of my users to untrusted third parties? My site security could be amazing, but if my users sign up with some completely untrustworthy OpenID provider, their accounts are going to get stolen and I can't do anything about it. And Well, yes, it does. But again, so do these forgotten password emails. Um, 
with, with forgot, like, like I said earlier, forgotten password, you go there, you click, I forgot my password, it emails you a one-time token. And so right there, you're outsourcing the security of your site to whoever the user has chosen as their email provider. I'm not saying this is an ideal situation, but it does at least mean that if you're willing to put a I've forgotten my password link on your site, you should be willing to adopt OpenID. The, the threat model is essentially the same. So if email is secure enough for, yeah, so email is secure enough for your user authentication, then so is OpenID. And really, password emails, these forgotten your password things, are actually SSO already. They're just SSO with a deliberately bad user experience. What are the privacy implications of this stuff? This is the other question that comes up, um, comes up frequently. And well, there's a bunch of these, but the most obvious one is cross-correlation of accounts. If I'm using an open ID in lots of different services, someone or something could tie, or some crawler could tie together the, um, all of those accounts and build up a huge profile of my activity online. And um, I think there's, there's an important lesson for OpenID consumer sites is that you should never publish a user's OpenID without making it abundantly clear that you're going to do that. Like, I will trust a site. I, I, I'm OK with Flickr, public, with, with different blogs posting my OpenID so I can tie my comments together. But at the same time, I need to know that that's going to happen. You should, at the very least, you should allow users to opt out of sharing their OpenID. So if you sign up for a forum, you can. Um, if you sign up for a forum, you can either say, yeah, display my open ID under the posts I make, or you can, or you can pick a username um, distinctly for that forum. Is this going to lead to the online, equivalency, the online equivalent of a credit reporting agency, if you can tie these different things together? And yet again, this is already a problem with email. You, right now, today, you could, a bunch of sites could conspire against their users and cross-correlate their, their, their email addresses and build up a massive profile. And I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure the legal protection, protections against that kind of thing already exist, be it in the form of privacy laws, data protection laws, or just um, the, the ridiculous um, uh, Secu uh, privacy agreements that everyone, that nobody reads and everyone clicks straight through. Um, so again, it, it's not a new problem. And there's a new feature in, in OpenID 2.0 called Directed Identity that's tack that aims to solve this problem. With Directed Identity, when you sign in with an OpenID, instead of entering your OpenID, you enter the URL of your provider. And the provider then invents a one-time OpenID that only works for your account on that one site. So at the very least, the, um, the sites can't correlate you. Your identity provider still knows all of the places you're signing into, but at least they can't correlate your OpenID and, and figure out that, that your accounts are the same. Uh, patents. Patents are always scary. And there's some good news on this front, because both Sun Microsystems and VeriSign have announced what's called, what's called a patent covenant. And again, I'm certainly not a patent lawyer. But as my interpretation of this is that they, both those organizations have said that they won't smack you down with their patents if you're implementing stuff around OpenID 1.1. And maybe more importantly, they will smack down anyone else who tries to assert their patents against OpenID. So patents are basically this ridiculous Cold War. But at least OpenID has a couple of massive allies on its side looking, at, looking out for it. Who else is involved with this stuff? Well, this is a slide I, I stole from David Cordon, who, who does a lot of talks about OpenID, um, showing the total relying parties, that is, consumer sites, sites you can log into using an OpenID, according to one provider, myopenid.com, which is one of the more popular providers. And you can see that adoption has been going up. It's, it's a pretty healthy looking adoption curve. There are now around about 3,500 sites you can sign into with OpenID. And if the trend continues, we're going, going, to, we're going to see that number keep on increasing, especially as open source, um, open source projects like Movable Type 4, which is becoming open source, now has support for OpenID. So it'll get increasingly easy for people to create new sites that you can sign into with an OpenID. Uh, one major backer of, of OpenID is AOL. AOL um, quietly set themselves up as an OpenID provider back in February, the thing where any of, six, all, any of the 63 million AOL user accounts work as OpenIDs. And they have announced at a, pre, at a conference in Paris a few weeks ago that they're going to be a full consumer by the end of July. So any, any AOL service that you can sign into with a free account, you'll be able to use an OpenID instead. And that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, on the Microsoft front, Bill Gates expressed, expressed Microsoft's interest at the RSA conference, again, a few months ago. And unfortunately, I haven't really, I haven't really found anyone who understands quite what that means. As, as far as we can tell, it's mainly as good PR for their card space thing. He could say, Microsoft really like OpenID, and with the addition of card space, it'll be secure from phishing. So, but, but at least they've, they've shown interest. Uh, I mentioned Sun Microsystems, who have this patent covenant, and they have 33,000 employees who have Sun-only OpenIDs. So they're already pushing the boundaries on what it means to have an OpenID. 
Uh, one thing I forgot to put a slide in for was the country of Estonia. Estonia, a few years ago, introduced um, electronic ID cards for, one, for their one and a half million population. And quite recently, they, some, evidently someone in the Estonian government is quite forward thinking. He said, well, we've got these ID cards. Let's do an open ID provider as well. So pretty soon, you'll be able to, you'll see people signing in for an, an Estonian open ID provider that proves their name, their first name, their last name, and that they're an Estonian citizen. And that's like, that's pretty mind blowing, but it's, it's really interesting to see that kind of stuff happening already. Uh, six Apart uh, actually invented OpenID. OpenID was invented by Brad Fitzpatrick of LiveJournal, and it's built into a lot of Six Apart products. Uh, a LiveJournal is an OpenID, a type key, a Vo and Vox accounts are both OpenIDs. You can sign into some of their stuff with OpenID, although not as much as I'd like. And they've recently announced OpenID support for movable type 4. So that, again, will, will really help push adoption in sites that you can sign into. Uh, VeriSign, I mentioned VeriSign seatbelt stuff. Uh, David Recordon, who's one of the key, one of the principal editors of the OpenID spec, is a full-time VeriSign employee, and they've got their own OpenID provider as well. Uh, there's a company called Janrain, which you may not have heard of, but they're pretty important because they're based in Portland, Oregon, and they're responsible for basically 90% of the OpenID libraries, the open source libraries that people use for integrating OpenID. So if you're building sites in Ruby, Python, PHP, you, you could go to these guys and get a fully formed, really nicely, really well tested um, li uh, library for, to help you implement OpenID. Now, Yahoo, um, who, are my, uh, who, I, who I used to work for, uh, supporting in OpenID, but only indirectly. And this is a, this is a hack that I built uh, back in January called idproxy.net. And what idproxy.net does, it's an OpenID provider, but instead of you creating an account there, you sign into it using your Yahoo account through Yahoo's browser-based authentication. And really, the, it, the, I did this more, as a, more to prove a point than anything else. And the point was that if you're going to do some kind of authentication API, if you're going to do Yahoo BB Auth or Google Auth or whatever, you may as well support OpenID as well, because if you don't, somebody like me will crop up and build a middleman in the middle. I actually know of one of these, that, uh, of a similar site that does this for, for Google accounts as well. I just don't think the guys um, quite, quite wrapped it up for release just yet. So yeah, Google, that's the big question. Are you guys going to do OpenID? And I think there's, there's a bunch of great reasons to do it, but there's the fact that someone else will do it for you. There's the, um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I was quite tempted to just, I, the original version of idproxy.net actually used Google authentication, but your auth API doesn't really, um, it doesn't really support single sign-on. At the time, I had to ask for permission to access the user's calendar, even though I had no interest in their calendar. So I found that a bit creepy and, and ended up not, not, not launching that. Um, but there's a bunch of things within Google that OpenID is really well suited for. There's things like um, if, you're, if you're editing Google Documents, maybe you'll want to, maybe you want to share that document with a bunch of people. So you could, instead of the thing you do at the moment, you could say, well, these five OpenIDs have the ability to, to, to see this document using the, the account pre-approval stuff. And again, you, got, you, you have your authentication API. When you, well, you, you solve the phishing problems and stuff for that, it would be really great to have a Google OpenID provider that people could start like, trusting and, and building other stuff on top of. Now, if you want, any, if you want to know more about this stuff, um, OpenID.net is the user unfriendly but developer friendly home of the specifications. Um, OpenIDenabled.com is a site that links through to the open source libraries for all of these different languages, so you can start playing with that. And I'm a bit of an OpenID magpie. I collect stuff about it from all over the place and stick it up online at simonwillison.net slash tags slash OpenID. And I've managed to leave uh, 15 minutes for questions, so thank you very much. Okay, there's a question right there at the front. Why, why now? Why didn't this happen five years ago? I would love to know the answer to that. Um, uh, why now? Why didn't this happen five years ago? Um, I have no idea. Five years ago, I was still in school. <laughs> five, no, five years ago, I was just starting university. Um, I think people had already tried this stuff with Passport and so on, but what they'd missed is the importance of it being decentralized. No one's going, and like Six Apart had their type key thing, but no one's, nobody wants to trust one single provider that sits in the middle and controls everyone's identity. And I think with OpenID, it is, it is an idea where you look at it and you think that's so obvious. How could someone not have come up, come up with it already? But um, as it was, it was Brad Fitzpatrick that first put the pro proposal together in back in 2005. And since then, it's been quietly brewing away and people have been poking at it and experimenting with it and eventually getting excited about it. And I think it's, it's about time that it broke out and, and really started getting popular. Um, there's a question there at the front. I know nothing about Kerberos, really. So I, I, I won't take that question. Um, sorry. 
uh, ones who are in the blue, t blue shirt. So uh, if a hacker, a man in the middle, or something were to change the, the delegation identity provider uh, link in your site yep. to be the one that accepts everything, does that suddenly mean everybody can sign in as you? Yes, it does. And, um, actually, I, I, and this really scared me a few, uh, a few weeks ago when DreamHost, uh, who are a really popular website host, lost 3,500 FTP passwords to in, in un undisclosed circumstances. And that was pretty scary because, yeah, if any of those people had been using, hosting an open ID and th their password got out, then their page could be changed. And this is why I think it's important that companies with really good reputations for security start supporting this stuff. Like, I, I, I run my open ID off my own little virtual server, and I, I can't say for sure that it's secure. But if there was a, if there was a, like, if Google were hosting my open ID and promoting the fact that they're really good at security, that would be a great thing for the standard. And again, but yet again, it ties back to email. Like you could, somebody could crack my email account and steal all of my forgotten password reminder protected things. Oh, yeah, I really, I really should start doing that. There is a delete button in Gmail now, so so maybe I should start using it. Um, there in the brown shirts. Um, so when you were describing it uh, before you started, before you answered the question about 2.0, the first thing I thought of is, gee, I'm going to want a dynamic number of these with which are randomized yeah. and all focus back to the same underlying idea. Absolutely. What's the status of 2.0? Oh, I, I was almost hoping people wouldn't ask that. So 2.0 is an ongoing effort to incorporate. It's got some great ideas in it, like this, um, like this directed identity stuff. But it's also Kind of, it's it's a bit of a result of all of these um, different identity standards getting together a year and a half ago, and as a result, it's quite big. It's a lot bigger than OpenID 4.1. There's stuff in there which personally I'm not at all excited about, and so I'm kind of hoping that that um, that the directed identity bit from 2.0 will be backported to 1.1, and maybe to create 1.2. I know people are talking about doing that because that's a feature I really want. But there's other stuff in 2.0 which a lot of people aren't quite as excited about. Um, just in front, of, front there. Uh, it seems like, as a consumer, why would I want to allow any open IP provider? Wouldn't it be make, make more sense to be a white list of providers that I think are reasonable? Ah, so choice? the question there is, uh, as a consumer, why would I want to allow any open ID provider? Wouldn't it make more sense to whitelist just the ones that I trust? And I think you're absolutely right. Now, the open ID there are people within the open ID community who will strongly will shoot down that idea as being against the spirit of open ID. I couldn't disagree more. I think open ID, like I said, it's a dumb network. It's up to people at the edges how they use this standard and what use they make of it. And if you want to whitelist a list of open ID providers who you've sort of audited and you trust their security, then, then I think you should be allowed to do that. At the same time, it's again, it's, it's back to the forgotten, for the forgotten password thing. There are sites that won't let you sign up with a Hotmail account because they think you're more likely to be a spammer. So, um, and I think really with open ID, you can, you, can start, you can start whitelisting accounts and that would be fine. Um, but again, you want, you want to be pretty inclusive, because at the end of the day, you want people to sign into your service. And if you tell them they can't sign in because they use the wrong provider, they'll get upset and they'll go away, and they won't, they won't try out your thing. There is um, one, interest, one thing that I've been thinking about recently is the case of banks. Now, banks do not offer a click here to be emailed your password thing, because I, presumably because they don't want to outsource the security of your account to your email provider. And so I think for, for that, so I said anyone who does that should be, should be willing to support OpenID. That means that banks shouldn't be willing to support it. But yeah, if there are providers that do two-factor authentication and are certified and so on, then why shouldn't the banks whitelist just those and say, yeah, you can use OpenID, but it has to be from this list of a dozen or so providers which we know are really well secured. Just a comment on that. You could actually also, the bank could require you always to have an OpenID first, and then they'll, they'll even, they won't even talk to you without one. They really want to keep it. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love my bank to be an open ID. If, well, presuming they up their security, which is a bit bit weak at the moment. <laughs> I, I I don't know if uh, I think UK banks have just started to send out those um, those key fobs, which I'd love to get because I think that's a really good idea. Um, there. Uh, you mentioned earlier that OpenID can pre-populate some forms and sign up for sites. That still has the problem of uh, decentralizing your profiles. Are there any efforts to centralize that so 
Yes, absolutely. So the question was, um, OpenID can help you fill out a form on a site, but you're still like from a like you're, you're still copying your data all over the place. If you ever change your surname, then you have to go and update it everywhere. And yeah, absolutely, people are working on this stuff. There's a emerging standard for OpenID called Attribute Exchange, which is currently being working on, which takes the simple registration thing and extends it, and means that you can pass pretty much any data you like back and forth. And Again, you could, you could invent your own scheme for that right now on top of OpenID and it would work, but it's no good if, no, if, people, if other people aren't using it. So I think there's, there's a lot of room for people to get involved with helping build the specifications for that kind of stuff. Um, Kevin. Well, follow up to that one. The other thing is because um, OpenID authenticates the URL, a URL you can then make queries against to find other information from. So you can use multiple months embedded in the page or you can use it as an APD endpoint. Uh, right there. Yeah. So, what about using OpenID on applications that aren't web-based? So, I mean, like you know, like right. Subversion or email or any of those things. So that's a that's a really great question. The question was, what about using OpenID on applications that aren't web-based? So, desktop applications and Subversion things and so on. And there isn't a great story for this yet. Open, like I said, OpenID ch chose to solve one very small problem, and that problem was web-based authentication. But actually, yeah, that's, it's re very relevant people want to do that kind of stuff. Now, there are some crazy hacks. There are people who've got subversion, command line subversion authentication working, where when you try to authenticate with subversion, it launches a local web server and then fires up your browser and does the redirection thing to your local web server and then shuts it down again. And that works, but yeah, it's not, not ideal. Um, I think it's an ongoing question how that's going to happen, but the more people involved with that and the more demand there is for that, the more chances that somebody will come up with a decent solution. Um, right there in the light blue. So you mentioned a couple of the big issues uh, with OpenID that scare big organizations. You're uh -huh. uh, putting all your eggs in one basket and phishing. Um, another one is usability. <coughs> usability studies really show that the average person doesn't yet get typing in a URL instead of a username right. or a passport. Uh, okay, so. so the question there is, is usability. The average user doesn't get typing in a, a URL instead of a username and password. Now, I hear this argument a lot. One thing I will say is most users, they have no idea what a URL is, but you ask them what their MySpace page is, and they'll tell you it's www.myspace.com slash whatever. So they understand the concept of a URL as an identity, even if they don't get what, what else, uh, even if they don't get the implications of that. Now, from the point of view of OpenID, one thing I want to see people start doing, and I've considered doing already, is rather than you say, sign in with your OpenID, or if you have a live journal URL, paste it in here, or if you have a MySpace account, type in your MySpace ID, or if you have an AOL account, type in your AOL ID. And of course, what, uh, yeah, I'm not so much a usability person, but of course, what you're doing there is someone gives you an AOL thing, and you you, we whack openid.aol.com on the front, and it just works. So again, I, I, it's, it's, it is a problem, and it's something which there are smart people in the world who solve that kind of problem all the time. So I, I, think, I think it's surmountable. You just need the, the right people doing the work to explain it to people and show how it all works. Uh, are there any more questions? One right at the front. So devil's advocate, what about the issue of OpenID identifier recycling? Oh, that's I, I actually meant to talk about that. So, yeah, there's an, there's an issue, OpenID identifier recycling. And this is where, again, this relates to what if someone else, um, someone else gets hold of my domain or whatever. Um, I'm sure you guys do this. Loads of people with a really big username, do, username um, database do this. They've got like 100 million accounts. All of the good accounts are gone. Somebody hasn't signed in for five years. So you make their identifier available for someone else to register again. And obviously, that means that person can then steal and then like, log into any accounts they'd use with OpenID. Now, there are a couple of things I'll say about that. The first is, obviously, with identifier recycling, you do only do it after like, a five-year gap. At least, I hope you do. Um, but what you could do is say, if, if you've got a user database, user database that isn't primarily for OpenID, you could say, OK, we do identifier recycling, but if you've ever signed into anything with an OpenID, then we don't. We, we stick that on that we're not going to recycle this list. So that's, that's part of the solution. Um, again, a defense you can get come down to is that um, this already exists with email. If you're doing identifier recycling on my email address, then someone else gets my email address and they can use forgotten, my pa forgotten passwords to steal all of my old accounts. So it's, it's not ideal, but it's, it's a wider problem than just OpenID. And I'm curious, uh, nowadays a lot of sites are using your email address as your login, mm -hmm. and they have a password. And that. Is there any, are there any numbers on how many people might be using exactly the same username and 
has run out every single state that they signed into. I have absolutely. Well, I, I don't know about numbers of people using the same username and password on every site that's signed into. I imagine it's huge. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is, um, you know, MySpace got. Um, my, MySpace got, had 35,000 of their user accounts stolen in the phishing thing uh, last year. And it's a great attack, because what, what happened is somebody wrote a little bit of CSS that put, the, put their own sign-in link and absolutely positioned it over MySpace's sign-in link and used that to steal accounts, which I thought was quite ingenious. But, um, that, but the 35,000 accounts that were stolen were actually then circulated widely. So you can get hold of this, um, of this database of 35,000 accounts and use it to analyze what kind of passwords people are using. And Bruce Schneier wrote something up on this a while back where he pointed out that people are actually using quite good passwords. Like a lot of the passwords were seven characters or more. A lot of them mixed up. OK, so people's passwords are a lot better. But yeah, as for numbers of people using the same username and password, I have no idea. I imagine, I imagine it's huge, but I haven't seen a study. Partially in response to that, only because I happen to know some of these things. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just draw some two different studies and the Bruce Schnapp thing you just mentioned. I'd, I'd love to talk to you about this later, then. But one is that uh, the average user has 18 accounts at mm -hmm. different sites, and the average user, ha user has 3.49 passwords. So that's okay. how much password we used there is. OK. And that was that was, if, if people didn't hear, that was um, the average user has 18 user accounts and 3.49 passwords? Yeah. yeah. That, Kind of encouraging, but the most common password in that list was still password one. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, well, it was a very small percentage of users that had it. It was the most common, but still, it was it was a small percentage. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, in that case, I think I think I'll wrap things up. Thanks a lot. I'll be around for quite a while if you want to talk to me about this afterwards. So thank you.